I doubled for Dean Kane once in uh, Gentle Ben 2 when I lied about my weight and my size. And when they got me in his costume, everything just sagged. But that was like the one day where I sat in the back seat with like a wig that would fit on my head. Um, We've been called a lot of things. And we're inspired by everything around us, including each other. The individuals that have inspired me the most create beauty and positive change. To me, that's the highest form of art, and it deserves the loudest praise. This is Shout Out, the art of self-expression. On this episode of Shout Out, the screenwriter, illustrator, t-shirt designer, film and stage performer, Garrett Vanderloen. I fell into uh, drama at school and into the theater department, the pulse from the audience, like to have people looking at you, like they had no choice. You're on stage, you're the show. Like, uh, <laughs> um, there was a charge I got from that, a little rush. Definitely my dad, I mean, everything came by way of my dad. So I think my dad would give me the skills and my mom would give me the oomph to just give it a shot. Always that theater department was always my biggest salvation. Like my stuff has to kick ass out of the gate from the first page, from the opening scene to the last page. And that was the job that saved my life. I was in the costumes and I did that for a year, but it was just, it was just bumping, just a gasp above rent money. It's in my writing, it's in my work, those things we experience, those emotions, those people, those people who wronged us, the people we wronged, like that stuff plays still. All right, Garrett Vanderloen, thank you for being on the show, man. Thank you for having me, buddy. We're going to start this off kind of loose, and then we'll we'll kind of progress and get a little bit more serious as we go. Okay. Early childhood influences. Definitely. Definitely my dad. I mean, everything came by way of my dad. You know, he had, he was a product of the 1960s, like sci-fi era, and he read all, he saw all the monster movies and read all the comic books and made movies with his buddies. And then when I was born, you know, all that was just full indoctrination and anything he saw, I saw. And sometimes I would ingest it. Sometimes I would reject it, but it, it, I think my taste, my palate came from my dad. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of PBS as kids, a lot of Sesame street. There's certain jingles I'll hear from that show that still kind of linger and haunt me. Um, it was also the era of like recording TV or movies off of TV. So I have a lot of like half movies embedded in my head. Like I didn't see the full Star Wars until I was an adult. I thought it was always like starting like mid fight halfway through the movie. Um, and the commercials just seem so natural to me. Like I remember the commercials as much as I do the movies. Cause you just watch those things over and over. Um, something else I saw today was, uh, did you, I don't know if you fell in love with it, but, uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Oh yeah. Like I felt like we saw that a hundred million times, but <laughs> I don't think I think you know why I think I saw it is because I think unless it's been tweaked, I think it was recently Mo Large Marge's like death date, and so I think people were running that. But I didn't really find it funny as a kid. I thought it was so scary. So did I. <laughs> you know, oh like uh, <laughs> so I did mean, cause, I. Because remember, it kicks off with his cool house, and then he goes outside. And then Francis is just leveling like a threat. And yeah. I'd never seen anybody come across so hard like that. And it's just, you're going to pay me. We are, you know, he was so mad. <laughs> and then, you know, obviously the large Marge thing, the, the big old guy who chases him up the dinosaur. And the, uh, the mattress guy scared me. Because remember, he's the, uh, the convict picks him up in a car. Yeah. And he's like, well, what did you do? He's like, I don't want to talk about it. And then he finally confesses, like, you know, those tags on your mattress that say, don't cut them off. I cut them off. And uh, as that freaked me out, I would look at those tags and, like, I wouldn't even want to touch them. I thought, like, <laughs> it was, you know, jail or bust if you touch those tags. But um, just, you know, Willy, just everything. It was a mishmash of Willy Wonka and the Muppet Show. We, had, we were the era of Saturday morning cartoons. Um, you know, I love G.I. Joe, the... Uh, it was like appointment TV. We had TGIF, we had SNCC, we had uh, America's Finest Home Videos, just things, appointment TV that you'd watch with your family or on your own. Um, that's all, like at all times, just rearing its head day to day. 
And what was what was kind of like your routine um, growing up? Like, how were you creating? What did that look like? I think I've, for better or worse, always subscribed to if I see something I like, I got to try it. And, you know, drawing came a little more naturally because my dad could draw. He showed me how to draw. Was the, the nice balance is my mom can't draw to save her life, but she always encouraged it. So I think my dad would give me the skills and then my mom would give me the oomph to just give it a shot. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I was drawing from a very young age. Um, you know, we're, we, we are children of the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. I remember being so fascinated by that. I started drawing levels with our friend, Joey Brown. Like we would just draw levels that you would kind of walk through with a pencil. <laughs> they were like one, <laughs> one shot ponies and you would just like, oh, I got the coin box and you draw a little coin and then the pencil tip would go through, you get the coin and we would draw levels for each other. I think we were doing that in like third grade. Um, I did stop motion at one point that are just terrible, just agonizing beats of animation. Cause I was like, well, we have a camera. I have Play-Doh, which is the worst model for doing claymation. Um, and then just started making movies with friends. Um, because again, you have the camera, you have bad costumes. I had friends that worked at Party City and not only would they take stuff home from work, but they knew that at work, they would throw stuff away, perfectly good stuff. So we would go dumpster diving afterward and get fresh wigs and costume and blood and whatever we needed. And we would shoot with that stuff, just very um, DIY um, environment, I think in our hometown. And uh, if I saw something I thought I could do, I would just do it. Like at one time, I think I thought I had it musician career potential. And um, that was born out of just bedroom performances. And my friends were musicians. So it just seemed easier to be friends with them if I could be a musician too. But I just don't have any of that. But I would try it. So I have a huge question because in high school, I just, I lacked, I think, the courage to go into drama. And I always admired it. You know, all you guys that were doing that. Was that something that like, you had to kind of overcome a fear or was it just like, no, this is something I want to do. And you just leapt right into it. There's such an import that I think is just um, self-actualized where social currency seems like the only currency that's worth anything in school. And I think, you know, those days were so motivated by my need to be accepted. That's what we're all doing. Mm -hmm. And I think originally I did my first time I ever did any type of theater was when we were in middle school and um, you know, just the, the pulse from the audience, like to have people looking at you, like they had no choice. You're on stage, you're the show. Like uh, (laughs) um, there was a charge I got from that, a little rush. And then when we got into high school, I didn't see that just kind of assessing the situation. Um, it felt like the play to make was athletics and you and I played soccer together poorly. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but we looked good. <laughs> yeah. I remember that was the stress. <laughs> you kept stressing that over and over again. Hey, but we look good. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the uniforms were we always on point. <laughs> we had nothing else. <laughs> I never let those socks sag. I kept those things tight and upright. Oh, man. Uh, we were so bad, but I, <laughs> I still, I mean, it's, I think something I've realized, cause you know, I've, this is getting ahead of myself a little bit, trying to not to ruin your flow, but there's this blind optimism I have when it comes to myself and my ambitions. And I think even as bad as I was at soccer, I thought, well, wait till they see me next year. You know, when I, when, when I have to make varsity and I couldn't, you know, I I didn't put in the work to do that. It was just up here and not anything, you know, like the thought of like practicing during summer to get ready for the varsity team. Like (laughs) you got to be insane. I got stuff to do. I got MTV to watch. I've got to draw things. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But um, so that, that didn't pan out. And I think I kind of bottomed out and just grasping at anything. I fell into uh, drama at school and into the theater department and that for so many reasons because I got perpetually more withdrawn and uh, disinterested in the the, the social minutia of high school um, as things went on but drama was always that theater department was always my biggest salvation I'm so thankful I had that then 
and certainly now. And um, it's such a such a warm safety net. You know that that more than I mean, I, I think you probably admire the performance part, which is wonderful, and it was. And I still had that adrenaline rush, but just to have that community of weirdos. You know, every single person in that space is is looking for a little handout. And I mean, I don't mean a handout for money. I mean a handout to to hang on to. Yeah. Um, and that camaraderie and those friendships is just so essential. After high school, like when we were working on, um, you know, film together that my brother and I created Lost Woods. Mm-hmm. And when we were in that environment, I it finally clicked for me because all the way up to that point, it was just, again, it was like scary. It was just terrifying to me that like, oh, I'm going to get in front of a camera and, and, you know, have to say lines. It's just absolutely terrifying. But getting into that environment and being, you know, around you and Joey. And then I realized I'm like, oh, like kind of like what you just said, where it's like, oh, we're all weirdos and we get to be as weird as we actually are here. Why didn't I do this earlier, you know? Mm-hmm. And I always admired that, like, you made that move so much earlier than uh, than I did. And speaking of moves, like, when you made, when did you go down to L.A.? When did you make that career decision? So when, when we went to high school, I had just this guilt of being an older brother and the guilt of being the, the son of a lifelong teacher where, in spite of my need to have these social goals realized, I also had to be a good student and those things just don't compute at all. And I busted my ass middle school right up until senior year when I realized it was pointless. And that again, when we're talking about the currency of high school, like academic currency is, is worthless. Nobody could like, Oh dude, that's a straight A student. You know, like that doesn't, that doesn't play. And on top of that, I felt like I ran into some, teachers we had that were uh, more interested in just being um, on one side of the power dynamic than they were um, teaching us anything and having a back and forth um, give and take relationship. And maybe I was wrong. Maybe some of them truly were like that, but I just decided to just shove it all off my senior year and like grades and like mood just was like, and I was getting phone calls home, which I'd never done before from teachers because I was just calling them on it. Like, you don't care. You just want me to do this thing because it's a thing you can check off. And like, whatever I write on this page doesn't matter. It's like, just very, I got very cynical very quick. And the last unwritten contractual obligation I had to my family was to complete college. So I did Sierra College. I did community college. I got an AA barely because I was still not interested. But because it was art, I took a lot of art classes and could kind of pad the things I didn't want to do. Um, but I finished that. And then I told everybody I'm done and everything else I'm doing now is for me. And so I, I think I just pretty much, as soon as I was done, I think I had moved within like two months of finishing Sierra college, moved to LA. Uh, I think we went down with my family on a road trip. I looked at a place. It looked amazing during the day. And then I settled into there (laughs) and the very first night there was gunshots literally right below my window police helicopter with the searchlight below my window. And I climbed in a closet and I called the cops and I was just like, there's, there's a gun. And they said, okay. And I said, out my window. And I didn't have any more information to report. And they, and I said, and then, cause I said, I think you're already here. Cause there's a searchlight in my backyard. And they're like, yeah, we're good. We got it. Thanks detective. <laughs> and that was just my wake up call to like, this is me untethered alone. And this is the decision I made and I don't have anybody here. And I think that was 2002. And um, I worked a job at Warner Brothers Studios. I was at a fine dining restaurant. I lied lied my way into that because I had done like two years at Red Robin. I was like, I can take plastic trays. I can, you know, bust tables for Christopher Nolan. Like what's the difference? Who cares? And it was all like 45 year old, 50 year old wait staff veterans. Like that was their career. I was thinking this is just a job. I walked into people's careers and I had no business being there. I couldn't handle more than one plate into my arm. And they wanted, you know, like the 20 sack. Like I didn't have that skill set. And I lied. Um, and I quit within a month and I had no money. And the last thing 
staring me in the eye as like a lifeline was uh, was Disneyland. I that was like the one vacation we could afford as kids. I've always loved Disneyland, and I auditioned for their character department, and that was the job that saved my life. I was in the costumes, and I did that for a year. But it was just it was just bumping just a gasp above rent money. And it was such a long drive because I was in Koreatown in LA. It was like on a good day, an hour to drive down there. I was falling asleep on the road, but it was like, I love the work and it kept me alive. And it was like a theater community again. You know, I had a sense of community, the higher group I was in with, like will be my friends for life. Even now, like I love those guys. Um, so that was my like full immersion. Like you're alone, like you're so alone and you got to figure it out, run it. And I did. I'm here. <laughs> what kind of characters were you playing during that time? Uh, they're broken into height ranges. So like my height, which I've lied about at various times over the years, but I definitely rank in the goofy height. So it's like 10 different characters that you and I could do. Mm -hmm. And then there's Pluto height. There's like Mickey height. And there's like some kind of hybrid heights in the middle, like Chippendale height. If you don't quite hit one ra range, but you hit the other. Um, so I did, um, I mean, predominantly I did a ton of Goofy and Captain Hook and Queen of Hearts and Baloo and Bear Bear. And I think on the surface, it sounds ridiculous. Like you did what? You were inside what? But like if I put you, I mean, I know you would get it. If I put you in there one day as the park opens. Now this is like, I've been in there recently. Obviously characters are behind barriers and because of COVID they can't touch and you have to be so far away. But this was the heyday where you can go face to face. And if you're that goofy for a family that has saved their whole life to go to Disneyland one time yeah, and that kid runs in and he thinks you are the goofy. Right. And I know that sounds like an ego thing, but I just mean it's a heart thing. When that yeah. kid comes in running at you and you're that guy for them, like that's yeah, like what a privilege to do that. Yeah. You know? Um, so it was, it was a really, really, really cool time for me. Um. When did Second City, when did you get into that? Was that shortly around that time, shortly after? Yeah, I went, so Disney, I was there a year, 2002 to 2003 is October to October. And um, I almost moved home a year in. I was so homesick. I was driving home like every, almost every weekend, if I could find the time, just, I, I couldn't. Because um, that community that I found in, at Disneyland lived around Disneyland. So I couldn't drive an hour and a half to work there and hang out there and then get back home at the logistics. I just was more than I could handle. And I was, I was lonely on a romantic level. Like that was, you know, the curse of my whole childhood was longing for that, <laughs> that wife that never was. But um, I just decided it's not for me. I'm moving home. And it got to the point where my stuff was uh, in a moving van in front of my place, my dad and I were sleeping on the floorboards in Koreatown. And in the middle of the night, we were going to wake up the next morning and move everything to Sacramento. I middle of the night, I woke up and I told my dad, I said, I can't do this. And he was like, what the fuck? Like, you know, with it just grinding his teeth. Um, but I just had this revelation in the middle of the night that if I came down here all this way for one year, to piss my pants and go home because I can't handle it. I have nothing to show for it. And I know, I, I know, I, I knew I didn't have it in me to come back again. So if I went to Sacramento, that was it. And getting to your second city thing, there's, there's everything we want to be. And then there's everything other people think we can be. And, you know, be that at home with like, I feel a tremendous amount of pressure in a good way to my two younger sisters who who they see me as, who I want to be for them. And that's at home, you know, that your parents have expectations for you. And then, you know, now we're literally marking our 20th, 21st, you know, uh, uh, since graduate, since we graduated from high school, it's like, yeah, we just had that reunion. That stuff is still very relevant to me. You know, it's in my writing, it's in my work, those things we experience, those emotions, those people, those people who wronged us, the people we wronged, like that stuff plays still. And I remember in that drama class, we talked about, you know, that was the heyday of like the Will Ferrell years of SNL. And it was also, again, appointment TV. There was no DVRs. You watched it or you missed it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we would also videotape stuff. And because that um, 
it was such a wacky theater department, but we kind of ran our own ship there. And if there was a play that you weren't in, you just had the period to, you know, F around in class. And so the teacher or the student director would be on stage and the rest of us would be in the classroom, like reenacting WWF stuff. I used to do that with Adam Candela. We would just body slam each other in the classroom. And we would also on TV watch SNL and we would quote it and talk about it and rerun the bits with each other crack each other up. I remember Lena Litz was doing that a lot and Carrie Newton, we would just bust each other up with just recycled bits that we were watching. And somewhere in there, I got the gall to say, I want to be on that show one day. And then that gets to be the thing. You know, every person in every small town has the person that's going to do it. <laughs> and I, I think I felt some seed had been planted then that when I moved to LA and I weathered the storm of not moving home, I made the realization that, oh yeah, I also need to do this thing, which is the improv thing. Cause that's the thing that gets you to SNL. And if I don't learn that skill, you know, I can only do so much with my basic small town theater training. So I went to second city because it was the fame school that a lot of the classic SNL people that we love came from. I mean, primarily Bill Murray, like is my kingpin as far as um, comedic gurus go and um, I just wanted to taste some of that that rarefied air of that school but I went there and I met again I found the camaraderie of my peers Um, I fell in with a group they usually try and keep you in a single group as you move through their programs and I think that was collectively but maybe a little time off for the whole group I think it took us like two years to go through their graduate program And again, it's not the same as they do in Chicago where you go on this main stage show where people buy tickets and they have a huge theater and you tour with your your sketches that are born out of improv. Our school was just, I mean, it was like a 20 seat theater, a little black box theater. Um, But that um, it was that same electric charge of like, not only are people looking, but I'm pulling this stuff out of my ass. And that feels so good. And it feels so good when you're with people who know what you're going to do as far as okay, if I throw, I mean, in real time, you're kind of massing out all this stuff. If I say this, that he's likely going to do this and I'll respond to this. And it's pure listening because you can't have an idea of like, no matter what, I'm taking the scene to a basketball game right. because it's not going to work when the guy says, what are we having for dinner? It's like, oh, but I wanted to do a basketball scene. You know, you got to let that go in real time. And while that has not borne the fruit of putting me on SNL, those skills influence everything I do right now as a writer and just the, the, the naturalness of having a conversation with you with some of the terrible jobs I've been in, like just to be able, it's rolling with the punches. That's all it is. And um, that's benefited me in many, many facets since going through that school, which I love. So how did that transition? Cause you started acting in movies. What did, what happened during that time? Cause I mean, all these little transitions, like you were just, moving along and i'm like how is he doing this it was all just a mystery to me so what what happened between like second city and then you actually like landing parts i can't i can't think of the i mean the parts you're referencing you know i did i've done some i did stuff back home i did a um some uh, really bad local movie good people i won't name any names or mention any plot lines I did your movie, which was tremendous. Um, I doubled for Dean Cain once in uh, Gentle Ben 2 when I lied about my weight and my size. And when they got me in his costume, everything just sagged. But that was like a one day thing where I sat in the back seat with like a wig that wouldn't fit on my head. Um, uh, But I, I started to write because I was frustrated and it was just stream of conscious stuff. I think I was journaling for a little bit. Um, And then that turned into well, this isn't going to, journaling isn't going to serve me in any career ambition. So I'll just write a script because Hollywood and guess how good my story is. And I wrote my exact story of like moving from home to LA, like changed a couple of names, you know, bullseyed a couple of girls that I thought deserved it. And it was horrible. And I think my saving grace is that was the first screenplay I'd ever written with maybe some, there was a Barnes and Noble walking distance. And I might've bought some book on screenwriting and just followed the structure to the T, but I mean, the content was just garbage, but I was working at a bar and there was a bartender who had had some success as a playwright. I think Michael worry is his name. And he, 
I think the biggest is been working ever since. Um, tremendously gracious to me and um, helpful to me in my endeavors. But I showed him the script, and he, it was. I mean, it's god awful. It's so bad. Um, it was just so laced with personal. So there's no ins and outs on the scenes. It was just like I woke up this morning. Here's it. everything that happened until I went out the front doors. Like, this is 20 pages of just a guy living his life. What is this? A pathetic guy living his life. But um, he, he gave me notes on it and they were very um, well-intentioned and very um, constructive. And that inevitably built its way into writing stories about other people from different perspectives with different genres that wasn't so tied into me needing to unburden myself of some bad day I had. And, you know, that's part of what came from this LA experience, just developing my own skin and, and feeling comfortable in it, dude. Like I was, I did, I mean, I'll tell, I worked for a long time in nannying. My last job as a nanny was with teenagers. And if, if the moment had ever allowed for itself to be brutally honest and it did on occasion it was always um geared towards me telling them like you could because kids today have it way worse than we did like if, if we had social media i honestly don't know if i'd be here today because like, i was so bummed out by the things i missed out on but i didn't have to see it but now if you're staying home from something you're going to see it all over the place the things you're missing out on and i don't think i could have withstood that torture but i've told you know, kids coming of age today, when that the conversational opportunity allows for it, like I didn't get comfortable till I was like 25 with me, with who I am, with what I have to offer, yeah. with what I really want to do. You know, I moved down to LA at 21 and I didn't make the decision to kind of put all my eggs in the writing basket until I was 26, 27. Like on one hand, that's a lot of waste of time. But on the other hand, like that's all the time I needed to just sort myself out. Right. I think everything I write now is obviously a product of what I've, I'm watching and what I've watched. I think there's always a collision in my work between the nostalgic magic of the things we love growing up. Um, I don't know why it always comes top of mind because I only have like one fantasy script, but like Willow, like I loved Willow as a kid. And I think hopefully that has a resurgence when this show comes out on Disney this year, but I don't think that was like top tier pop culture when we were kids, but something about that movie just clicked for me. Um, so I've always got that childhood nostalgia burning in my head, but then there's the realities of the world around us when we're adults, like things suck, things are disappointing. Uh, people want to give it to you and yet sometimes it's too hard to take. And so there's an element of the truth that plagues today's world always colliding with the hope that was in the stuff we grew up with. And I think that probably informs my writing more than anything, just on a spinal level, you know, what's, what's beaten underneath it all. And then the ticky tacky stuff of like, actually where you're supposed to start a scene or end a scene or, you know, how one scene can feed into another, like that's just trial and error. I took, I went to UCLA, I took film and TV writing courses there and, and just the generousness of, people who do it better than me who have looked at my work and told me how to make it better. If you could model your career after like one screenwriter, who would that be? I, well, I don't think Soderbergh writes all of his stuff. I think I haven't gotten into all of his credits, but I think it's frequently a collaboration or a story by credit and then I'll have somebody else write it. Mm -hmm. But this past year, I just kind of sunk real deep into the, Soderbergh verse and just his I think the disconnect between me wanting to definitively say I would want his career is I think a lot of his projects he makes with his mind and I think a lot of mine are steered with my heart like um we watched um like I watched all the Nick I'd never seen that tv show and I'm regurgitating something somebody told me better but effectively he made that show on no money made it look like period piece New York thing he shoots with natural light. He holds his own camera. Like there's all this stuff that I'm envious of that like, oh my gosh, he did that. And that he made the Nick, then he made the Oceans movies. Then he made Che, the two part, just insane biopic that he did in Latin America. I mean, that's not even a movie that the world was calling for. He just felt compelled to make that. We watched, of all movies, uh, Magic Mike, I think on New Year's Eve, loved it. 
It's an incredible movie. It's not what I thought it was. I avoided it for so long because I just didn't want to see Channing Tatum twerk all night. But it's a lot of law breakers around. (laughs) (laughs) I was so dying. Like it it didn't pay off till the last like 15 minutes to finally see McConaughey work it. But I was like, man, thank God. Like I didn't want to sign up for this and not see that ass. (laughs) <laughs> you know, but he, he like gives it up too. like all those guys are going for it. Anyway, it's a story about a guy who's just trying to do better. I mean, the, the story at the heart of all that dancing and stuff. And um, I was into it. I'm into what he does. Um, but I think he's very workmanlike. And I think it's just there's just not enough heart on the page for the things I like to write do. OK, so kind of getting into what's currently going on right now. Mm hmm let's let's dive into that a little bit you've you've got a lot of life going on yeah i think you know i think we all do but it's all it's relative i meet with a um group of buddies every tuesday night plus or minus my new baby um virtually and we play board games online that has been my quarantine salvation for myself and i think they would say as much too I have now two incredible children as of like five days ago. Um, Congrats, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have more scripts in my stack, but none of those have been produced. I'm just like any other guy who came here to write and it's just has things he's written sitting in a desk. But I exist in this space where hope is right around the corner with my career. I always feel like it's right there because I know I know I'm getting better. Like my stuff has to kick ass out of the gate from the first page, from the opening scene to the last page. It has to leave you wanting for more. And then I have to find the people who are willing to look at that. Like there's all these little hoops you jump through. But I think of it like I came down here and that was the first mountain I had to climb. And a lot of people don't do that. And I came here and I weathered that. And then every day I got to get up that mountain again and write more pages or send it out to more people or see the thing. And I keep going up there because I keep thinking the, the good view is like, right. Like I, I could see the glow of it. You know, I can almost see that. And it's gotten to the point where, you know, I now live with a partner who has seen, she has seen the view on the other side. Like I'm living with somebody who's looked over the mountain. She, she started as an actor and then somewhere in there, she made the transition to write for herself because she wasn't getting an audition. So she wrote a role for herself, found somebody to co-direct it with. That led to representation. It led to her writing on a TV show. You know, she got to, as I had, had been working whatever jobs for 15, 20 years and then got the career job suddenly. Like it, it, I saw that happen to my partner. That's an insane thing to be next to. But she got a grant from Netflix, made an incredible short film that hopefully can be turned into a feature. She's interviewing tomorrow for another TV show writing job. Like it's, it's in my house. That's, that makes it so much more tangible. So I know that I'm not foolish to look every single day for that view over the mountain because I feel like it's coming. So you brought up something that I'm extremely curious about because analogies are extremely powerful and you talk about climbing the mountain and I've noticed that you have started climbing a lot. And this is very bizarre to me because again, we growing up, we've said this multiple times, but I'll say it here is that we're kind of bizarro each other. And we, you know, we have very similar tastes and influences and things that we're into. As I started seeing it, I'm like, of course he's doing this. It just seems like it's, it's kind of baked into us. Well, I like you extremely afraid of heights. I will never skydive. You could tell me you'd set me up for life tomorrow. I wouldn't even go in the plane for that kind of money. Never mind, jump out of it. I just don't have that at all. When we made your movie, you know, I, I, it, t- I wasted half a day for you guys getting me to jump off the lowest ledge. I wouldn't even do the high one. I think we like tried to make it into a character thing, like, oh, this character is like too cool for the high one, you know, and like, but just a nightmare. But um, I think, I think. So one of the other odd jobs I've had along the way, I've worked as a character at Universal Studios um, for Halloween Horror Nights, run around for two months and scare people, which is awesome. But it also brings, it's that whole theater energy. Again, it's a weird collective of people that are all weird. And we're all just in this very weird, specific niche skill set of scaring people. But I think there was one day we used to loiter around after we would check in because we had a lot of dead time before the park closed and changed into the Horror Nights event where there was like, we were like in a garage where we'd check in and get our costumes. And there was a guy like climbing just like a chain link fence 
because he was being cool. And I remember looking at him like, this fucking asshole. Like, oh, you're real cool. You're climate defense. Like, let's bench press right now and see, you know, who's really got something going on. But then I kept watching. Him. I was like, man, that is actually kind of cool. Like, he's got a lot of grip strength. And <laughs> and I think it just made it, it spark some kind of an itch where I looked in the area and found a rock climbing gym nearby. But it's like, they're not cheap. And I think Eileen, my wife and partner, she, I think she sprung for like a one month gift certificate or something. And that was enough to push me over the edge because that covered like the initiation fee if you kept on. And uh, initially I was, I mean, I'm still not great at it, but I've been doing it plus or minus, you know, the pandemic and having it shut down and open and shut down and open. Um, I think five or six years. And I, I boulder, I don't do the ropes because you need a partner for that. And I really like to be alone. Um, so I just climb, you know, on the, the problems as they call them that, that don't require a rope. But I remember the first couple of times, like, cause some of them, you know, you top out, you climb over the top. I like get halfway and it looks like you're hundred feet up. It's yeah. like maybe 15. There's a little, like, I think I got to call somebody like the real panic of like being pinned under a bench press at the gym, like wanting to call out. It's that yeah. same kind of like, Oh, somebody's got to help me. Like they got to call the fire department or, but <laughs> you know, there's just, a, there's enough embarrassment there to just go, fuck it, just get up. Just, and yeah. now I'm over that enough where I can just drop and it's fine in that distance, even though it still kind of messes with my head, I can handle the drop. But like you said, it is such a, it is as physical as it is, it's very Zen because it takes a mental component that doesn't allow for any BS, anything I'm dreading or worried about. Cause I have to figure out where the hand and the foot is going next and um, solve the problem. So all I'm ever doing is holding that solution and then whatever physical endurance I have, and there's no room for anything else. Yeah. So I love being there. I call it the dojo because it's just, it feels so Zen and freeing and it kind of clean cleans my palate. And then when I'm driving home is usually when I like, like something gets, unjammed from like you said like something else i'm working on and like oh yeah this scene has to go there blah 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 you know something else gets freed up just because i take that time to turn it all off what advice would you give to to somebody that's wanting to get into screenwriting <laughs> buckle up baby <laughs> uh i i had i lean last year my wife paid for a consultation with a guy who's a development executive at CBS or something. But the consultation was a side business he does where it's like a career evaluation thing. Where have you been? Where are you going? Where do you want to go? And he kind of helps put the pieces in order to see if there's some other things you could be doing to put your career ahead. And one of the standout moments from that conversation, he said something to the effect of like, if, if there was no shot at a career, would you still do this? Something like that. And I said, of course, like I, I have to write like these stories that come up from out of me as some expression of something I'm working out again, even if it's a completely different person, if it's a woman, if it's a kid, if it's something that seems so disconnected to me, I'm still working something out that bothers me in the outside world or from my past or what I'm dreading in the future. Um, and I just, it's part of who I am to put those words to a page, to tell a complete story, even if it's just for myself, which to this point it is. Every single thing I've read, it's the most solitary career you could have with such a um, eye towards such a big finish. Like it, you do it all alone maybe forever, but it's all towards wanting to have everybody see it. Like I want these visuals actualized. I want people to watch what I've written. I want people to say my words. Um, but in the end, I'm letting these scenes play out because it makes me happy because it lets me breathe at the end of the day. And um, so I think as with any career, I think any career you don't have that you want, you have to want it so bad that you would continue doing it even if it never happens. Um, and so I think it's just always, a, you got to check yourself to make sure it's something you really want. And then you can't keep banging your head into the same wall. And I think that's one of the greatest gifts and joys of meeting Eileen and having her be part of my life. She is such a hustler. She will find so many sneaky ways to get from point A to point Z and I have always been the guy that like, why isn't this working? You know, just jerking on the same door and 
don't get caught up in the frustration. Always keep writing and always find new ways to share that writing. And you can't, I think Stephen King in that his amazing book on writing, I think you've read that. I've read it a couple of times. Right. Even as somebody who doesn't really like his work, that, that book is invaluable. Um, but he just always stressed you can't write if you don't read. So you got to read scripts. You got to read good scripts. You got to read bad scripts. Read the classics. Read the ones that your friends have written. Um, take classes. Get in a community. Like it's as isolated as a field as it is. Once you hear other people's voices bouncing off your, your work and their work, like looking at other works, let's let you see what's wrong in your own work. And um, even as solitary as it is, it does get better communally. Um, even if that's virtually or just like another script next to your script, you know, um, you got to want it and you got to find new ways to get it done all the time. Great advice. Um, anybody you want to throw a shout out to? Uh, I got, got to give it up for mom and dad. I did that at the top. Um, I wouldn't have been brave enough to do something like this and to continue doing something like this if it wasn't for their freedom of expression they gave me as a child. Um, you know, we come from a similar hometown. We didn't have a lot of money, but I didn't know that till I was older because that's the kind of magic world they built me up inside of. Um, and then, you know, I'm not just saying this because you're here, but you guys, the Ellering brothers, the Ellering family, like I've known you forever, um, that you guys had the guts to make a film on nothing for nothing because it was a vision you had. Like I will forever consider that to be one of the best things I've ever done. If not just for the hangs in between, like I will Dude. never shake those memories. So many good thing. memories. <laughs> like I love you guys. I love those guys that we built it with. And um, you know, those laughs are untouchable. And the hauntings, there was ghosts, definitely. Um, so, you, you know, I, I'm always inspired by what you guys do and what you guys have done and will continue to do, I'm sure. Um, my friend Matt Oates, when I first moved down here, he uh, I met him doing a show right before I moved down here. And it just so happened he was also living down here and came home to Sacramento for the summer. And he was my only contact here for years and years. He has given me 5,000 meals for free, taken me 5,000 movies for free. He's never asked for anything in return. He, more than anybody, has read my terrible work and helped make it better. Uh, when I was back home and making movies with my buddies, we never did anything with them. We never edited them because nobody had that kind of ambition or that kind of follow through to get anything done. I brought him to L.A. and Matt, just for the sake of an exercise, edited all of our movies um, just horrible, you know, teenage movies, but he did it and he cut it to music. He cut it to time, like the timestamps. It was just an incredible endeavor. Um, we've been through some of the brutal dark nights and happy days and just some of the most is the most generous person I've ever met in my ambitions as a writer. And he is that view that I'm looking at over the mountain. He's getting ready for something like nobody's ever seen. And I can't wait to see it. And I love everything he does. And I love him for who he is. And um, our mutual friend, Nick Reinhardt, who I grew up with, it's my last shout out, um, is a musician's musician, like none other. Uh, when we were having overnights as kids, I would remember, you know, it'd be the normal, we'd eat something, drive around town, go scope out the uh, Barnes and Noble parking lot or whatever, go cruise down, sunrise. And uh, we'd inevitably end up at his house, play video games, and in the morning, we would just wake up to guitar because he would just turn on like, it's also practice time and you guys can go whenever you want. He would just be jangling, wouldn't even communicate with us. He always wore this cowboy hat. He put on a cowboy hat and just start noodling on the guitar because it was just go time. He has worked harder than anybody I know at their craft. He has accomplished so many wild things that I would love to do in my career. He, uh, he interviewed Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth. He does work with Fender. He's played in all kinds of weird super groups. Uh, he has his band. He has multiple um, solo band things he's done. He has designed pedals. And he is just, he too is that guy that's just, he's got a view coming up that none of us are going to touch because he puts in that work and everything he does just slays me, man. Like it just, I see him pushing. I go, I'm not pushing hard enough. You know, I got to get back in there and get into my work and get into my pages because of how much he puts into his craft. Phil, good morning. 
this is unusual and maybe unusable, but I was reflecting on the conversation we had yesterday. This is the day after. Uh, a little sleep deprived. I don't know if you see it in the eyes, uh, but you can certainly see it in the cause of it all here. Chase Simone, my baby. And uh, he's dictating a lot of my mental state right now. So maybe this is uh, the sleep talking. But uh, specifically, as it concerns the shout out list I made, I think I would be very remiss if I didn't lead with a name that is at the forefront of my mind, <laughs> my mind and my heart right now. Alicia Rapko, my late mother-in-law, she passed away a couple of days ago. She was born in Argentina. She was part of a social political movement to embedder that country, to uh, fight for the rights of its peoples and equality in that country and fell victim to the military dictatorship in the 1970s. Her and my father-in-law were forced to exile as the government began to persecute it and disappear its own people, some 30,000 people many of them youths, the brightest minds, the greatest artists, the best teachers, journalists, anybody with a progressive thought in their mind were eliminated and never seen again. And so they left under duress. They made it to Mexico and eventually the United States, who is in many parts, I hate to make this political, but to blame for that dictatorship. They enabled it as they have done many times over in the world. But uh, they made a life for themselves and she made it a point from that day forward to make her entire life about selflessness and social political justice in the world abroad and usually against Uncle Sam, our own country, uh, specifically as it pertains to the ridiculous blockade in Cuba. She did work to free five political, illegally detained political prisoners, uh, the Cuban Five. Uh, if you search her name on Twitter, basically the entire country of Cuba is uh, tweeting in Alicia's name and memory. She was an amazing woman with a beautiful smile and wonderful grandkids, and every single one of them will grow up in the light she left behind. Um, I love her, I miss her, and uh, I do consider her somebody worthy of all the shout outs I can give. I love her, and I hope that my work and the work I try to do to better this world comes in some small way close to what she did because. Uh, she was something special and I love her. Thank you.